Now, for more, we're joined by US golf writer Rex Hogard, who was over at Le Golf National. Uh, Rex, thanks very much for joining us. That press conference was wrapped up very prematurely. I think the press officer there realised that we were onto something, frankly, and both uh, Jim Furyk and Jordan Spieth did not want us going over to Patrick Reed for his take on things. But we certainly got Patrick Reed's uh, take on things, and then some. Yeah, he read the room really well, and, and it was interesting. You were sitting in the room just like I was when the question was asked. Patrick kind of deferred to Jordan, who was all the way at the other end of the table with kind of a smirk. So I think they both saw it coming, and Jordan jumped into the microphone and gave his answer, and Jim did as well. And it is interesting now that Jordan uh, Patrick has had his opportunity to speak his mind, uh, how things played out, and it shows a level of dysfunction in the U.S. team room that I don't think anybody expected, to be quite honest with you. They talk all week long about being united. They talk all week long about being a team and playing behind Jim Furyk. And it turns out that certainly, at least in Patrick Reed's place, that wasn't the case. Yeah, I certainly read the Patrick Reed look down the line because they were at opposite sides of the table. I read it as a look down the line as if to say, Jordan, do you want to do this? Will we do this? And, you know, it was interesting he used the line when he was talking to Karen Krause in the New York Times afterwards that I was almost on the point of lighting up this press conference a la Phil in 2014, I thought there was a look of mischief thrown in with the read, look down the line, as if to say, Jordan, I'm willing to do this if you are, and obviously Spieth did not want to get into it. He did not, no, and that's very interesting. I mean, we all remember what happened in 2014 with Phil Mickelson, and I think a lot of people, at least on the U.S. side of the Ryder Cup, feel like that what Phil did that night in Scotland, as difficult as it was for Tom Watson, certainly, but even Phil Mickelson to a certain degree, because he took a lot of criticism, that it opened a lot of doors and began a new chapter for the Ryder Cup. Because I think, at least in the United States, when you look at what came from that, the task force, which has turned into a committee, which really led to the victory in 2016, and now to end up where we are now, you know, I mean, it ended up being a worse loss in Paris than it was in Scotland four years ago. So I think it's a very bad spot for the U.S. team to be in, and it makes it even more complicated when you consider the fact that Patrick Reed is going to be on these teams for at least the next decade, if not more. I mean, he's a world-class player. There's nothing in his game to think that he's not going to continue to be a world-class player. And they need to figure out a way to work him into the team room. I will say this, that when you look at, and I thought Jim was going to be a very good captain, and I think he made a lot of very good decisions, but there are some decisions that are always going to be second-guessed, and I think the Patrick Reed situation is one of them. And you look at the dynamic in the other team room, and I think that Thomas Bjorn had just as much issues in his team room as maybe Jim Furyk had. It seems like Thomas handled them much better than Jim did. Yeah. Reed and Speed had a 4-1-2 record together in the previous two Cups, the Ryder Cup and the Presidential Cup, and uh, Reed's point certainly to Karen Krause and his wife's point was, well, you don't need to like someone to work very well with them. So it seems his big issue is that he felt blindsided. He turned up at uh, Le Golf National fully expecting, it seems, to be paired with Speed only to find out, well, that's not happening. Uh, Spieth in this new buddy system is very much going with Justin Thomas. And, I mean, to be fair, Reed's second choice was Tiger Woods. And going into the event, Tiger Woods didn't look like a bad bet and it would seem to suit Reed's personality. But he did certainly feel a little bit, am- a little bit ambushed, it seems, by the Speed decision. Um, I mean, the genesis of their issue or Speed's issue, I mean, we, like, I think the wider public have got a feel for the issues surrounding Patrick Reed after he won the Masters and, and the issues he's had with people going back to college. And then, quite memorably on tour this year, Reed was in a rules dispute with an official and may have said, and he was, he was picked up in Mike, frankly, saying, well, Jordan Speed would have got that drop. Jordan Speed being very much the golden child of American golf and Patrick Reed being anything but. So maybe... All of this combined and uh, the arrival of Justin Thomas and the Ryder Cup team made up Jordan Spieth's mind. I guess it's tough if you're Jim Furyk. One, you want to keep Spieth happy. And two, you do have to find a partner for Tiger Woods, that perennial problem. And there was maybe an argument that Reed was a bit of an answer. So, you know, benefit of hindsight is tough on Jim Furyk. But in advance of the competition, you can see how he might have found his way into a Jordan Spieth, uh, Justin Thomas and Tiger Woods, Patrick Reed combination. And it felt like it was going to be a, a good pairing going in. And, and, you know, I mentioned Thomas Bjorn. I feel like most people know that it wasn't going to be easy for him to pair John Rahm with anyone on the European team. I mean, I think it's not quite Patrick Reed level, but I don't know that John would have been the most popular guy in the team room. And there was some speculation that maybe he would pair him with Rory. 
going into the event, but then you look at it in hindsight, and I had someone who was inside the team room tell me that you send him out with Ian Poulter on day two. You send him out in the first match on day one. This feeds his ego and gets him excited, gets him into the team room, and you explain to him from the very beginning that, look, I'm going, only going to play you one match each day. I need for you to be at your best. Thomas did a really good job of getting John on board, and obviously he produced some points. Now you look at the other side, and I know right now it sounds like Patrick Reed may have gotten blindsided. I will tell you that I heard weeks, if not months ago, that Jordan Speed probably wasn't going to be paired with Patrick. And I think it was kind of obvious, given the relationship he has with Justin Thomas going back years and years ago. And I think Tiger Woods was probably a very good option. Mm. And when you look at how much respect Patrick has for Tiger Woods, and it seems like you, uh, the way Jim explained it in that sound clip that you just played, he felt like he could come up with two very, very good teams out of one. I can see exactly where he's thinking right now, but certainly Patrick didn't seem like he signed off on that. Okay, that's interesting. Well, I think it's fair to say if you knew about this months ago, really Patrick Reed must have had a feeling months ago. So maybe he's been slightly disingenuous when he says he was ambushed this week. The more surprising one was Kepka and Johnson. So, I mean, sure, people have seen this. This is really broken in the last 24 hours. They played together, obviously, in the afternoon foursomes against Henrik Stenson and Justin Rose and lost. But there's not huge shame in that, given how good Stenson and Rose are together. Uh, these guys work out together all the time. They're good friends. Played the final round of the U.S. Open together. You know, sort of nicknamed the Bash Brothers. Two big guys, big hitters. Uh, Polina Gretzky deleted every picture of Kepka from her Instagram account, and she was said to have been close by when the row erupted. One of the European players' wives, I'm reading from a report here in the Telegraph, was nearby, shocked and upset by the nastiness, which was very threatening. They had to be pulled apart. What's going on here? It will be interesting to find out. I mean, give Lawrence credit. He broke that story. It seems like it was a very interesting after party for everyone involved. Uh, in this particular case, and you talk about how close they are, I go back to the PGA Championship, and Brooks telling a great story of going to the gym Sunday morning at Bell Reef. And it was just a public gym, and everyone wanted Dustin's autograph. And even though he, Brooks was the one that was leading the PGA Championship, and everyone was whispering, there's the world number one, they spend a lot of time together in South Florida. They, they have this very unique relationship, and it is fueled, there is no doubt about it, by competition. And I think it's very much like two brothers. Mm -hmm. And when you have a relationship like that, you can very easily see how maybe things can get heated sometimes. I'm not saying that there's a fracture there. I think that remains to be seen. But certainly, I wasn't overly surprised when I read this report, to be quite honest with you. Yeah. I have brothers, and I know growing up that sometimes things get heated between brothers. I really think that in this particular situation, it's very easy to see how this could have boiled over. And it happened in a public venue, and then it became part of the media so quickly is a little surprising. But... Yeah, I could definitely see this coming. Okay, maybe they're so close they can actually fight and put it behind them fairly quickly. Whereas, I mean, I look forward to the tournament organisers, and you know they will do it, who pair Speed and Reed together as soon as they bloody well can for television. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's tricky. They're, they're going to have to, I mean, so, like, how does it work now? Jim Furyk, like, Paul McGinley, for instance, will not go near another Ryder Cup team again. He's no interest in being a vice-captain. He's served his time. Whereas we saw Davis Love went back in as a vice-captain this year. Jim Furyk talked at length over the weekend about going back in and helping with future Ryder Cup teams. So, uh, you know, someone's going to have to sort out the speed a read situation. And I don't know. I mean, look, we could be saying this for the last 20 years, but they're going to have to find a way to make the American team some way more cohesive, even half as cohesive as the European team seem to be, if not, you know, it may be unrealistic to be as cohesive. But you're going to have to do something here. You can't have every time they come over to European soil and they lose, the cracks just appear instantly. You cannot, and I don't think you can manufacture that. I mean, my criticism when we left 2014 and they created this task force was you can't create what Europe has. That happened organically. This has happened over generations. And these are players who are just naturally close together. You look at what Molinari and Fleetwood did last week. You look at the social media that came after the fact. I mean, that is a natural, very, very close bond that you just can't create. You can't manufacture that in the boardroom. Yeah. And I think the United States, States and the American team needs to realize that I fully expect Jim Furyk to be part of the next Ryder Cup team. I think I remember talking with Davis about this a few years ago, saying that when you take on a U.S. captaincy now, it, it's a six-year commitment because essentially you're going to be a vice captain first and then a captain, and then you're going to be a vice captain again on the back end. They're trying to create this continuity, which is admirable. I understand what they're trying to do, but they can't 
manufacture, like I said, that sort of camaraderie. You can't manufacture what Molinari and Fleetwood have. Mm. And the United States has to figure out a way to get a little bit closer. I think in what we have in Justin and Jordan right now is very, very close to that. And I think you'll start seeing a, a few more of those as the younger players come up. You have to wonder, was that Phil Nicholson's last Ryder Cup? You have to wonder how many more Ryder Cups does Tiger Woods have in them. Mm. I think as the team sort of turns over, we might see a new dynamic. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, Johnson Kepka can't fight every time, so, so I mean, presume they'll <laughs> repair things in time. It is interesting. So, like, you, you have Spieth and you have um, Justin Thomas and Ricky Fowler is very friendly with people and will often wait on the 18th when a friend has won. Like, we've seen that start to happen on the US PGA Tour. And yet it, it just is that bit different to how the European players come through. Like, Podrick Harrington will often talk about on the European Tour, it is just it is just known and accepted that if you come down to the hotel lobby at six or seven o'clock or whatever the time may be, there will be a gathering of people ready to go for dinner. And he certainly found on the PGA Tour, people have their entourages, players have their entourages. There is not that same level of friendship or camaraderie going on. So it is a more manufactured thing. And actually, you know, Speed and Reed are, are, are an isolated friendship as opposed to an overarching friendship. So there is that that cultural issue going on. You mentioned Phil. I mean, I was, in the, I was in the driving range watching Phil on Saturday and then Sunday morning trying to magically graph something which was not there. And he turned to his coach at one point and said, we're going to have to start from scratch. I mean, he had, he had just no game for the last month and admitted as, as much himself. We enjoy the task force, this effort, you know, put players in pods and groups. Like Phil's been the real driver of that. And, and that was his, his whole um, method behind the madness of 2014. So I wonder how Phil's feeling about the whole thing at the moment. I got it would be my answer to that. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. And knowing what we know now, what you saw on the range, that's a great story that you gave up. And he talked about it on Sunday night that he simply hasn't had a game for the last month since he was made a pick, which leads to the next inevitable question. Why in the world would you send him out and force him to play? I mean, yeah. that was the hardest format in golf. I mean, I guess that's a, another question for Furyk down the road. And we're going to sit here and second guess and Monday morning captain all day long. But mm. I mean, when it comes to Phil, at, at the beginning of the week, he talked about the idea that this was probably his last Ryder Cup overseas. On Sunday, I think he approached the idea that this might be his last Ryder Cup period. And I, I think that's probably closer to true. He's mm. 48 years old. I don't think that he can rediscover something over the next two years. He's certainly going to try. Mm. I know how important these are to him, and I can appreciate that. And I actually think he's going to end up going down the road and becoming a very, very good captain for the U.S. eventually. But... I don't see what the game he has now or the game he's had for the vast majority of this season outside of Mexico where he won the WGC. He really hasn't been competitive, Mm. and I don't know how he turns that around somehow over the next two years. Yeah. I mean, I suppose the other point to make here is these things repair very, very quickly and go away very, very quickly. And post Glen Eagles, we saw what the U.S. team did two years ago because the course was set up so perfectly for them. And ultimately, as much as this is a team game, the singles on a Sunday are still the singles, and Patrick Reed's going to go out and be, you know, lone wolf out there and win his singles. The four ball is still kind of singles. You play your own ball, you look after your own business, and surely of the 12, they'll be able to find at least three good foursomes partners, starting with, you know, Kepke and Johnson, who get on again, and uh, Spieth and Reed and get on again. And ultimately, they'll find themselves back in a course which really suits them, and probably win in two years' time, or certainly be favourites to do so. So the course, as much as anything, as much as all the dynamics we're talking about was crucial here, can you explain to me, deadly serious, why they couldn't hit a fairway? I mean, without driver in their hands, with hybrids and irons, how this US team, the best players in the world, could not hit a fairway, I still haven't heard a good enough explanation for that beyond the fact that the wind got up and spooked them slightly, which still doesn't feel like a great explanation. You asked me to be serious. I wish I could make a joke right now. This, this, <laughs> it, actually, in my mind, this is very, very simple. I, I wrote this on Monday morning uh, as I was leaving Paris. Uh, I really think, and we're going to continue to see this probably more over the next few Ryder Cups, and what you're going to end up with, and I think Davis Love figured it out two years ago, and it, uh, Thomas Bjorn perfected it last week in Paris. He created the golf course that was absolutely perfect for the team he had. Francesco yeah. Molinari and Tommy Fleetwood and Ian Poulter, and I can keep going down the list, they are fairways and greens guys, and they drive the ball relatively straight. They're not bombers. They're not going to come over to the United States and particularly dominate the way a Dustin Johnson will. Mm. Or uh, I'll go the other way, or a Roy McIlroy. Mm. And I will 
challenge you to say, Roy probably didn't have a great week in Paris. His team won, and he was very, very happy. But his style of play, Dustin Johnson, Brooks Kepka, the vast majority of Americans play a style of game that just didn't fit the golf national. I mean, give Thomas and the European Tour credit. They tightened the fairways. They grew the rough up. They mowed the rough towards the greens, I mean, towards the tee boxes, and they slowed the greens down about a foot slower than what guys are used to in the United States. And all of those things completely threw the American team sideways. I mean, you can go down the list, and if you look at the driving accuracy for the United States versus the driving accuracy for the European Tour, only two players out of the 12 Americans ranked inside the top 100 in accuracy. Seven on the European team did. Mm. I mean, he simply played to his strengths. Mm. And you can just expect to see the exact same thing in two years at Whistling Straits. Whoever the captain is for the United States is going to set up fields and fields of wide-open fairway. He's going to make the greens as fast as he can and put the pins in the middle of every green, and it's going to favor his suit. He's going to favor his team. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I can envision over the next 20 years we have home and home and home wins yeah. for the home team simply because of this dynamic. I know. It's a good point to finish on. And actually, you mentioned Brooks Kepka. I meant to mention that terrible story, the woman he hit with a uh, golf ball on the 6th has lost eyesight in her eye. I don't know if that story has made its way over there. Uh, really shocking story, uh, one of the kind of terrible things from the weekend. But on the golf course, uh, it strikes me as well it's damaging to the integrity of the tournament in some respects. We could have just a litany of home wins because Europe have perfected how to set up a course now, you know, and, and even the crowds are 30, 40 yards away from the fairway, so there's no trampled down rough. Like, we watch the PGA Tour every week, uh, players drive it into the crowds by the fairway and it's trampled down rough and it's room, you know, it's perfect. It's a hard surface to smack the mm -hmm. ball off and vice versa. Phil Mickelson hit the ball all over the place uh, two years ago and I think he still ended up with a 63 in one of the matches. Like, we may, we may reach a point here where for the integrity of the competition, we're, they're going to have to agree on some kind of more neutral setup so the best team actually wins because the golf course here ultimately was uh, the key factor in the European win as much as we're talking about the uh, US issues in their team. What do you think about that whole area? Uh, I would agree with you. I, I don't want to take anything away from the Europeans. They played brilliantly. And I, it, we, we, we sat and we talked about all the dynamics in the U.S. team room and the dysfunction, and that those are all issues, but I don't think any of this can take away from what Bjorn and those 12 Europeans did. They played magnificently, and I think you can't take that away from them. I would totally agree with you that I can envision a day where there is some sort of neutral body, where if it's in Europe, it's the RNA, if it's in the United States, I, I, I'm reluctant to do this, but let's say the USGA, no one wants <laughs> that to happen, but let's go ahead and just say that, and just create a golf course that's simply fair. Yeah. It doesn't favor one team or the other. And I can also see a, a day when the captains don't have any say in it, which is probably best for the competition. We're probably two or three generations away from that, but mm. I totally agree with you. Okay. Interesting times. Hey, I look forward to seeing who else fell out with each other on Team USA over the next few days. It's all coming out. <laughs> it will be an interesting couple of weeks. And as we reach, as we kind of go in, I mean, the PGA Tour's Starts, it starts the new season this week, and uh, it, it'll be an interesting few weeks as mm. we have an opportunity to talk more with Jordan Spieth, Patrick Green, Dustin Johnson, all of these guys. And it, it always seems to work out that way, right? I mean, there's always things that happen in the team room that we don't know about for months and months. It'll be fascinating. Yeah. On the um, last one, on the Kepka effectively blinding this woman in one eye, I, I mean, he, he was quite shaken at the time, I suppose, to a point, though she said she tried to tell him everything was okay. Uh, she, I mean, incredibly generous on her behalf, so she didn't distract him overly. But, I mean, I can imagine how he must be feeling. I know he's a tough guy, but you've lost the Ryder Cup, you've come to blows almost with one of your best mates, and the whole world knows about it, and to top off a terrible weekend, you've blinded an innocent bystander in the eye completely accidentally. But, I mean, that could really have an effect on him, as, as macho as he is. It really could, and I mean, I was in a press conference on Friday when he came off the golf course. He was asked about it, and he was very shaken by the whole thing, as anyone would. I mean, you never want to see that on the golf course. I mean, it's uh, absolutely devastating to see someone laying on the ground bleeding because of something that you did. And he shouted and four, we like, should say, uh, Rex. Sorry to interrupt. I mean, there were big shouts of four, but it's a long way away, and he hit the ball a good bit left. But, you know, he did shout four. It wasn't one of these, and those cases do happen where not, not enough is said from the tee. He shouted four, so he wasn't standing there and saying, well, whatever happens, happens. No, absolutely he did. And, and I think a caddy in the United States, Kip Henley, brought up on Twitter today, I saw that, 
really, I mean, we need to start being a little bit more cognizant about who and where the, the landing zones are. Because I think in a lot of situations, people are standing there and don't realize that you're pretty much in the line of fire. And yeah. it's very dangerous sometimes. And it, it, it I feel terrible for Brooks because no one wants to be put in this way, but even more so because of the fact that someone has lost their vision. I mean, yeah. that's awful for the game and it's awful for the event. Yeah, it was a shocking story to come out of it. You don't expect something like that. Uh, listen, pleasure having you on, as ever, US golf fighter Rex Hogarth. Thanks very much, Rex. Oh, anytime. Thanks for having me on.